Imagine for a moment with me. How many of you ever had a flat tire? <clears throat> flat tires on a whole lot of fun. I remember having a one car years ago. It was a piece of junk. I've told you the story before. My father told me not to buy it, and I went ahead and bought it anyway. I had six flat tires on that car. I drove it 800 miles before we scrapped it. Six flat tires and 800 miles. What a beauty. Anyway, so here we are. I've only ever had one flat tire while I've been driving. That was when I was driving a school bus once, and, it, and the, uh, the tire went off like a cannon, and uh, there was dust flying everywhere when those big tires blows. But normally, whenever I've had a flat tire, and I've had a few over my, you know, six years since I was 16 and got my license, and uh, you come out, and there's the tires flat. So I want you to imagine, you come out of the, you know, the store or wherever you're at, and you look, and your tire is flat. It's kind of discouraging, and there you are, and, you, and you've got good clothes on. I don't know where you've been, but you, you, you've, you've got some nice clothes on, and you're looking at this tire thing, and I'm going to get my hands dirty, and I'm going to get my clothes dirty, and right across from you, there's this beat-up van, and there's this guy in there, and he's a little bit scruffy looking, and he jumps out of his van. He says, I, I see you got a flat tire. He says, you're, you're all dressed nice, and I've got these, these old rackety clothes on. Let me change the tire for you. I, I, I couldn't do anything until you come out of the store. And, no, no, and you say, no, 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 that's okay. No, 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 please, please, let, let, me, let, me, let me change the tire for you. So he, he gets in, the, and you open the trunk for him, and he roots through all your whatever you've got stored in your trunk, and he pulls out the tire, and he changes the tire for you, and, and, you, and you offer him to give him some money. You know, and he's, you know, he looks like he's kind of down and out. No, 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 it's fine. No, I, I don't want any of your money. And, and, and he goes on his way, you know, and this van pulls out of the parking lot, and there's smoke pouring out of the back of it. It's, Probably a Dodge. And, and as he's pulling out of the, out of the, uh, the parking lot and you, and you watch him go and, you know, and you just, wow, you know, that, that, was, that was so cool. And you tell some of your friends, you know, I had a flat tire when I was at Walmart the other day and this guy, you know, in this rickety old van, like just, just a, it was terrible. He said, was it blue? Yeah, yeah, it was, it was a blue van. I know that guy. Yeah, you ought to see what he can do with wood. He is kind of a cross between Brother Aaron and Brother Joe, but not as good looking as those two guys, all right? And, but he can do magic with wood. And he said, well, I, I really wanted to give him something, you know, and, and, and to help him out because he looks like he's a bit down and out. And, and they says, yeah, well, I, I got his phone number because he, he did a little job for me. So they, they give you his phone number and, and, you, and you call the guy up and you say, look, I, I, I would like to get a, a, a bookcase made for my for my." My, my rec room here. Could, can you do that? I understand that you, you do some work, work with wood. And, and he says, all right, yeah. So he comes over and, you know, fair price. And he does a beautiful job. This is just a piece of furniture. It is just gorgeous when it's all said and done. And you look at the guy and, and, you, and you look at his, at his van and, you know, and at one point, you know, he maybe asks you to get something out of his van and you look and there's a sleeping bag in the van. And you think, this, this guy sleeps in his van. All right? Like, this guy is, he's down and out, you know, and you're thinking, what else can I do to help this guy? Because he wouldn't take money for changing the tire, but, you know, fair price for, for building this cabinet. I think, well, my, my fence has kind of fallen down at the back. Do you think you could help with my fence? And that fellow says, sure, no problem. I, I, I've done, built lots of fences, so he, he fixes this fence up, and it looks nice, you know, and, and every night he, he goes away in his van, you know, and you watch this thing smoke on down the street, and you get to thinking, well, he comes back and he says, look, I'd like a shed built out the back. Do you think he could do that for me? Yeah, yeah, no problem. He builds this beautiful shed, all right, and, and, and so forth. Well, it, time is going on. You know, you're paying him and he's doing a good job. And, and now it's, it's getting to be late fall into November. And you think, this guy is still just sleeping in his van. Like it's, and, and, you know, you, you really get to like this guy. And so then you, you say, I'd like to have my basement redone. And you think, oh, yeah, I, I can do that. He says, look, we, we've got a, a spare room down there. You know, there's, there's a separate entrance for it and everything. Would, would, would you like to, like to stay in that room, you know, while, while, while you're working in my basement? And guy says, well, you know, I, I don't want to impose. No, 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 it's fine. You know, we're not going to use that room. And, and like I say, there's a back door that goes in it, and you have some privacy. And, you can, and so you let him use the room while he's, he's doing your rec room, and he does just a beautiful job on your basement. And... You've been having meals with this fella, and you've been witnessing this fella. You bring him to church. And he's coming to church, and he's listening to what's there, and you, and you, and you explain you know, some, some of the gospel and get into some conversations with him, but he never gets saved. But 
he's working away and he's doing a great job on your house and, you know, and, and sitting at your table and, 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 and everything like that. And one day you go out and, you know, and you, and you come back and, ah, oh, George is gone. You know, he must, have, must be out getting something or whatever. And you go into your house and your wife's jewelry box is gone. The sock under your bed with all your money in it is gone. Your silverware is gone. And George has robbed you and left town. How do you feel? You've treated this guy nice. You've fed him at your table. You've been fair to him and given him above. And talked with him and, and brought him to church and he's come to church with you. And yet, he's robbed you and ran. They say, you know, you need to walk a mile in somebody else's shoes. So right now, I want you to take a look at your feet. And as you have slipped into some sandals of a couple from our New Testament, that couple's names are the wife. Her name is Apphia. And her husband's name is Philemon. And something has happened there. All right. They went through a similar thing. The church, when it first began, the church, when it first began at, at Pentecost, understand this, that's when the, the Holy Spirit um, came in his, in his fullness of, of what his, he is going to do in his ministry on earth. Now, before that, in the Old Testament, I'm going to read for you a verse out of, of 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. It says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament times, the Holy Spirit was there, and, and he... he inspired men like Isaiah and Jeremiah and David and, and many others and Moses and, and many others to write our word of God, all right? And, but it was, it was kind of a temporary thing where he would come and, and indwell those people for a little while or at least somehow it moved them to, to write our, our Bibles, all right, to what they are, inspire them by God. But at Pentecost, that's when the Holy Spirit came and we know in, in, in Acts chapter 2, when, the, when, the, when at Pentecost, when, when, when it first happened there, there were some signs that happened. Those signs were just for the, for, for the beginning. They don't happen now. We don't have cloven tongues of fire dancing on our heads because the Holy Spirit's coming. It was a sign that the Holy Spirit's ministry was starting there in Acts chapter 2. And as the church began, we know when, when Peter preached at Pentecost and there was 3,000 people got saved and, and they came and, 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 they, and they were joining the church, all right? They were part of the church. And, and these churches were, they didn't have a building all of a sudden, you know, well, the Lord has is, is gone back to heaven and Pentecost happens and, and, and they didn't have church buildings to meet in. Where they met was in people's homes. And they would have, and, and usually it was, not always, but usually it was people that had a little bit of wealth with a larger home that they could fit, you know, like 50 or 60 people in there, or maybe up on their roof. They used to do things on their roofs. And they would have these, these homes that were like that. And in Acts chapter 12, in verse 12, for, for actually before I get to that verse, you can, we'll leave it on the screen there, but before we get to that verse, Peter, you remember, was, was tossed in prison. And while, while Peter was in prison and he was, he was shackled in there, there uh, an angel of the Lord came to him in the middle of the night and struck him in the side to wake him up. And the chains fell off of his hands and the, and the angel says to him, put your shoes on. Well, put your sandals on. You're all wearing sandals right now. If I leave it not for your sandals. But then put, put your sandals on your feet and, and get, get, get dressed and come on. And put your cloak on. And he took him out of the prison and Peter thinks that he's, he's, he's seeing a vision, seeing a dream. And as, as he leaves the prison, you know, he goes by the first ward and the second ward, and he comes out, and there's the gate, and the gate opens up just like, you know, when you walk into Walmart or walk into Canadian Tire, and the doors open in front of you. It's just the same sort of thing. The gate opens up, and still he thinks he's in some kind of a dream. And he walks out into the street before he finally realizes, hey, I'm not in jail anymore. Chains are gone. This, this is real. And where does Peter go? Peter goes to Mary's house, the mother of John, Mark, all right, who wrote the book of Mark. In Acts chapter 12, verse 12, and it says, And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of, 
the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, there were many gathered praying, okay, gathered together praying, because there was a church in her house. There's another lady, her, her name was, was Lydia, she was a seller of purple in Philippi, and it's quite possible that there was a, a, a church in her home as well. We know that, that she came and, and, there was, and Paul was down by the river and, and preaching to a bunch of people that was down there, and this lady got saved and she got baptized and she said to them, she said, you, you guys come and, you, got, and, and, you, and you, st- you can come to my house. Use my house. You can stay in my house, all right? And we, and we see that after Paul was released from prison in Acts chapter 16 and verse number 40, and it says, and they went out of the prison and entered into the house of Lydia, and when they had seen the brethren, they comforted them and departed. They were again gathered together there. So it's possible that she had a, there was a church there in Lydia's house in the town of Philippi, but we know that there was a church in Colossae in the house of Philemon. I want you to take your Bibles and come to Philemon, a little wee book, no chapter, it's, only, it's all one chapter, just 25 verses. It's just before Hebrews, all right? A little tough one to find, but if you find Hebrews, just back up to the very first and you'll find there, there in Philemon. Look at verse 1 and verse 2. It says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer, and to our beloved Apphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. The ho- in, in Philemon and Apphia's house, there, that's where they had a church. They're in the, little, the town of Colossae, all right? And it, it, it was there, okay? And, and from what we, can, what, what we can gather from what Paul speaks of him, Philemon was a godly man. Well, he had a church in his house, for one thing, okay? But it also, it, it tells us there, he calls him his dearly beloved and fellow laborer. He is, Philemon is, is preaching and teaching the same doctrine that Paul's teaching and preaching. He is a fellow laborer trying to get the gospel out to the people in his town. All right, and from what we can see here in, in all these other different verses here, he was, he, he was a godly man, all right? And he was obviously a man of some wealth because he owned a slave named Onesimus. He owned this slave named Onesimus, and, and Paul considered him, like I say, a dearly beloved one that taught the doctrines, you know, and, and you might say, well, if this guy is a Christian... Why does he own a slave? Why does he own a slave? You know, and, and well, we need to understand what, one thing I want to make clear here is there's, there was good slave owners and there's bad slave owners, all right? And from what we can see here, Philemon was a good slave owner. A slave would be bought back then in, in this Roman Empire for about, the average one went for about 500 denarii, okay? And a denarii is one day's wage for the average guy, okay? So whatever that would be, 500 of those. And then some of them, if they were skilled at whatever they might be skilled at, skilled cooks or skilled workers or whatever, they might go for even more than that. But they would be purchased by the owner. And there was, there was so much um, slavery in the Roman Empire at this time, it's, uh, historians estimate there was up to 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire at this time. All right? I'm done with that one. We're good. All right? <laughs> and uh, hopefully I don't have to go back to it. But there was, there, so they had, these, they had these slaves, all right? One might also question why Paul never spoke against slavery, but instead he actually, there were some instructions that he gave slaves, you need to do this. Servants, you need to do this. Masters, you need to do this. And you might wonder, well, why, why did he not speak against them? Why did he just give them instructions? Well, it's this, quite simply. Paul was not called to fix society and the problems in society. He was called to preach the gospel. If he spent his time trying to right the wrongs of society to attack the Roman government, he is going to go nowhere. It's one little guy standing on his little soapbox for one afternoon until the Roman soldiers come and grab him and toss him away for going against that. And that's not what he's called to do, all right? 
That's not what he's called to do. When, uh, actually, when the pulpit committee was, was interviewing me and asking me some, of, some questions, one of, the, one of their questions that I was asked was, what role would I play to influence City Hall? Well, I told them, I says, unless it's something that's going to be detrimental to what we can do as our ministry, I won't be down there at City Hall. I'm called to preach the gospel. I'm not here to fix what the wrongs are, what the city's laws are, and so forth. Now, if it comes to where we can't meet here and, at church and so forth, well, yeah, I'm going to be up there, and I'm going to be on my little soapbox and jump up and down. But to try to fix things in society, that's not what we're here for. That's the ch I, th I think as a church, we do need to reach out into our community, and we need to show our community that we do care. But that's not the emphasis of the church. The emphasis of the church is to bring glory to God, and it's, and it's to help Christians to grow, and it's to help people see their need, their desperate need, their dying need, that they need the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Without that, the rest doesn't matter. We're here for, however long we're here for, let's say my aunt lived to be 101. Let's say we all live to be 101. That's, that's nothing compared to eternity that these people are going to spend in hell, and that's what we need to focus on. All right. So Paul did make some instructions as to how slaves are to react and how masters should be treating them, in a, in, but not, he didn't go any further than that. But there, there are some reasonable assumptions that we can make from, about rather, who Philemon was like, all right, and what his characters were like. I want you to take a look, and we're going to follow along as I'm going to read verses 4 down to verse 8. Here's Paul talking to Philemon. As you can see there, at, in verse 1, he says, Unto Philemon, the letter is to him. He says, I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast towards the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may be effect, become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee with that which is convenient. And, and uh, verse 9, he says, And yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such a one as Paul the aged, now prisoner of Christ. But we see there, especially in verses 4 to verse 7, he's, how he's commending Philemon for who he is. While he's commending Philemon for his character, for his godly character, for his Christ-like behavior. So I, we can assume from that that there, there's, that, you know what? He would have treated Onesimus fairly, all right? As a godly man, as a God-fearing man with a, with a good reputation from others as to what he's like. So we can assume he treated Onesimus fairly. We can also assume that because the church is in Philemon's house and Onesimus is Philemon's slave, Onesimus would have been in the church, at least attending, not part of it because he's not saved, but he would have been there and he would have heard the preaching. But he never got saved, all right, while he was there, okay? We know that he wasn't saved while he was there because we find out later when he, he did get saved when he, when he ran into Paul. But Onesimus, it seems, as, as we read here and the, the things that are missing and so forth, it seems that he robbed him and he ran, and he ran to Rome, Rome being the capital, Rome being packed full of people, tried to disappear into the crowd. But while he's in the crowd, guess who he runs into? Paul. The Apostle Paul. Why did he run? Why did Onesimus run? Well, he, he ran because of freedom. You know, we, we, we want freedom. We want, everybody thinks, you know, that, that I'm better off if I'm free. Our tendency is to think that I'm better off if I only have to answer to me and I don't have to answer to somebody else, especially if I don't have to answer to God. Hence the reason the theory of, revol of, of evolution came into play so that people, we don't have to answer to God. We, you know, this all just happened by accident. Blows my mind when you look at, at how God created things and how everything fits together and how you pull one of these things out, it dies. How all these things happen at the same time. It's just impossible. Well, it did all happen at the same time, but everything happened at the same time when God said, let there be light. We had light. And, and then he, and he created things, okay? They didn't just happen by accident. But we, we, our tendency is to think that I'm better off by myself. 
Total freedom. Total freedom. A ship at sea. You take out the engine. Is that total freedom? I went out of my, my boat a, a couple weeks ago. I don't know if I, if I mentioned this to you, but as I was crossing the lake, the fuel pump went on my motor, and I had total freedom. There's my boat bobbing along with no motor running, and I don't have a care in the world. It doesn't cost me anything to run because there's no gas going, being consumed, and everything's fine. And I'm thinking, well, and, and I, I can't stay out here forever. And I did see the car of my neighbor back there, so I'm going to give him a phone call and see if he can come out and give me a hand. And everything was fine. And as I was bobbing along in my freedom, I started getting closer to the shore and all these rocks. I thought, I better throw the anchor out and slow this thing down until my neighbor can come and hook onto me. And, and actually, it was very, very close to the side there. I'm grabbing onto somebody's dock, and then a neighbor come running out push my boat away that I didn't take a stock. But that's freedom. That's freedom. Now, the truth is, we were created, get this, we were created to answer to God. That's why we were created. We are created to worship God, to answer to Him. A child is safest when he's holding on to the hand of his parents. And when Drew was little, we had some rules. We, we get out of, the, out of my little Toyota pickup truck that I had at the time, and I said, what, what, what's the parking lot rule? And the parking lot rule was he had to take my hand, and away we would go. He's, a child is safest when he's holding on to the hand of his parent. A person is safest when they are submitted under the hand of God. At any rate, here he, he, wanted, he wanted freedom. Even Jesus, even Jesus, in John chapter 8 in verse number 29, it says, And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always the things that please him. Even Jesus, when he was here, answered to God the Father. And Jesus is God. Jesus is perfect. But he answered to God. We see further in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 39, where, and, and, as Jesus is about to die and about, about to go to the cross, and he, and he, and he says, to, says to God, he says, Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. He's, Jesus was submitted to God the Father. We need to be submitted to God the Father. But Onesimus here, okay, did, did, on, Onesimus, he wanted that freedom. So he ran. He needed some money. He took the money. He ran, all right? Now, the details of Onesimus does get saved. The details of his salvation are a little unclear other than the fact that it was when he met with Paul. Look at verse 10. It says, I beseech thee, again talking to, to Philemon, he says, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. All right? What, it's ta what he's saying there is, you know what? I led, was able to lead Onesimus to the Lord. And he's, he's, like, he's like my son. And, he's, and, he's, and, 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 and you know, it, it, it's amazing when, when we think about Onesimus' salvation. All right? He was in a church. He lived there. All right? But he didn't take it. He didn't accept it. The, the circumstances around salvation, different salvations, are, are different for everyone. I was... Five and a half years old, living up north, and calendar, when I accepted Christ my Savior. And I've, I've shared my testimony with you many times. Lenore was about 10 years old. She was in Pioneer Girls, where she accepted Christ as her Savior. Brother Greg was 26 years old before he came to know the Lord as his Savior. We were talking with, uh, with Bridget the, earlier this week, and she was saying how, how she was able to give the gospel to her mom just before, not, not long before she passed away. We're all of different ages, all of different um, circumstances around salvation, and, and those circumstances may be different for each person. But you know what the plan is the same. The plan is exactly the same. God loved Onesimus, an anonymous runaway slave, a thief, trying to blend into the crowds and be nothing, but he loved him just as much as he loved wealthy Philemon. He loved him just as much as he loved Paul, the great apostle. 
he loved him just as much as he loved Steve Taylor, even though he was just a runaway slave. God loves you too. And I don't know what your circumstances are. I don't know how old you are. It doesn't matter. Can everybody do this with me? <sighs> if you can do that, it's not too late. It's not too late. If you have never accepted Christ as your Savior, you need to do that because you don't know when that's going to stop. The one thing I learned from working at the fire department for 36 years was you don't know when your life is up. I've shared this a couple of times before. Probably the first 20 people that I had to deal with that were dead bodies were under the age of 25. Car accidents, suicides, industrial accidents, that sort of thing. Under the age of 25, you don't know. And I remember going to an accident out on uh, Highway 2 where a couple of trucks, transport trucks, and a car went through and there was, I think, three people were dead there. And I'm looking at this one girl. She's probably like 20. And I'm thinking, what were you thinking 15 minutes ago? And where are you now? I don't know. Maybe she was saved. I have no idea. But maybe she wasn't. But we don't know. You don't know. You might be lucky to be like my aunt, live to be 101. But you don't know. All right? But your circumstances are all different. Everyone in this, you know, what do we got? 60, 75 people in here this morning? That, that we, all, all of our circumstances are different. But one thing is in common. Jesus loves you. And you need him. I need him. I've known the Lord for 60 years. He's been my Savior for 60 years. All right? But you know what? I need him. Every day I need him. Every day you need him. Onesimus needed him and didn't realize it. There he was with some good people. With Philemon, taking care of him, feeding him. Yes, he was his servant. Yes, he did the things that he wanted him to do. Just like our friend George in his blue Dodge Smoky van. All right? But he didn't accept Christ as his Savior. Instead, what he did was he robbed him and ran. But God cared for him. And God showed him that he needed Jesus Christ as his Savior. And he let him run into Paul. And Paul pinned him down. He didn't hold him down. I mean, Paul was, but, but he ran into Paul, and Paul showed him what he needed, and he accepted Christ as his Savior. But you know, worse than the sin of, his, of what he did against his loving master Philemon is what Onesimus did against God. God is a holy God. And God cannot be where there is sin because he is a holy God. And realizing that, he set the whole plan of salvation into effect before he created anything. To say that I know that people, they're going to fail me because I'm the only perfect one. And these people are going to fail me. And, but I'm going to make a way. It's like I created them to begin with when he created Adam and Eve. They had fellowship, all right, with God. And they, and they had no sin. But they had a free will, just like we do. And they made the dumb choice of listening to what Satan had to say. Eve was tricked into it. Adam knew what he was doing. And he put his wife ahead of God and wanted to follow his wife instead of following God. And they both fell into sin and ate of that fruit. You know anything you want in this whole garden. All right? A whole garden is here to do whatever you want. Just don't eat from that one tree. Eve says, well, you know, it says we can't eat it, we can't touch it. That wasn't part of the deal. You can't eat from it. And Satan says, oh, yeah, you can eat of that one. That, you would eat of that, you'll be just like God. Oh. <sighs> And whatever that fruit was, I know traditionally they say it was an apple. I don't think it was an apple. To be honest with you, it, it could have been anything. It could have been a cucumber tree for all that matters. It's just a matter of this is what God said, all right? I think personally it was a tree that we don't have anywhere here at all. Never did, okay, and it's gone. But at any rate, that doesn't matter. The point is, is where they went against God. They made a choice. Just like Onesimus made a choice. It doesn't matter how good Philemon and, his, and Apphia were to him. He made a choice, and he ran. But he finally submitted to God, and God saved him, and God changed him. You know how I know God changed him? Because Paul wrote to the church of Colossae in the book of Colossians, all right? And where he sends uh, 
um, Onesimus back with this little book here, Philemon, this letter to Philemon. He sends him back, but in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 9, it says, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. They shall make known unto you all these things which are done. He says he is a faithful one, just like you. He has accepted Christ as a Savior, just like you. But what about Onesimus' debt? He's stolen. What about his debt? His, his debt to God is paid for by Jesus Christ on the cross. But his debt to man wasn't paid for, all right? He still owed Salvation cancels our debt with God, but it doesn't cancel our debt to society. If a man is, is on death row because he's, he's murdered somebody, and then he accepts Christ as Savior, praise the Lord that he accepts Christ as Savior before he dies. But you don't let him out of jail. He still has to pay the debt. All right? And it's the same with, with, with Onesimus. He robbed and he ran, but he still belonged to Philemon. And therefore, Paul says back to Philemon, thou shalt go. That's where you belong. Now, there is going to be some serious tests of character that are going to have to happen in this reunion. I want you to think here. Philemon's reputation as a godly man has been marred by the fact that this slave ran away. There is going to be gossipers. Sorry? They're all over the place. There's going to be gossipers who say, well, if he ran, he must have treated him badly. And yeah, he looks good on the outside, and yeah, he's got a church in his house, but you know what? Onesimus wouldn't have ran if Philemon was being good. And his, his reputation is going to be shot down by some gossipers, and there's other people who are going to say, you don't know what you're talking about, and cuff him in the ear. But there's, there's, these, these things are going to happen. Think, think of Apphia, his wife. His wife has lost her trust in this servant that she had. And this young man, this young servant that she had, is going to be stronger than she. And now she's like, am I going to forgive this guy and let him back into my home? The trust is gone. All right? And Onesimus, he's going to need to humble himself to go back there. There is no guarantee to Onesimus. He, he knows the character of Philemon. But understand this. Philemon has every right to have Onesimus executed for what he's done. There's no guarantee to Onesimus that everything is going to work out well. And I believe it did, but there's no guarantee. And these things are going to have to be looked at. But Paul steps in as a mediator. Much like Jesus is our, our mediator. There's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. As Jesus steps in as our mediator between us and God the Father, Paul stepped in as a mediator between him, between Onesimus, and between him and Philemon here. Look at verse number 16, if you will. It says, when, it, when you receive him in, okay, take him in, all right, um, I'll back up to verse 15 for that context, for perhaps he therefore departed for a season, but thou shouldest receive him forever, not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother, beloved, especially to me, but now much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Paul steps in, as a mediator. And then he, he goes on to say, you know, not, not, not just bringing him back. Verse 17, it says, if thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. He says, you know what? Don't treat him as a slave. Treat him like you would treat me. Like I'm, I'm on the line here. I'm going to let you just, I, I'm going to vouch for him. I'm going to be his, his uh, guarantor. All right? And, and I, want you, I want you to treat him like you would treat me. As a matter of fact, he goes on even a little bit further, and he, and he says, you know, if, if there's anything there that he owes, just like Jesus stepped in and paid the debt for our sin by, with his death on the cross, and I am oversimplifying things by just saying his death on the cross. When you think of what Jesus went through before he actually gave up the ghost for us, before he actually, his heart stopped on the cross. The mocking, the beatings, the everything that he went through the, uh, on, as he's on the cross and these well-respected priests and are going along, hey, if you're really God, you come on down off that cross, then we'll believe you. And all the taunting and everything that he went through before that. 
Just saying Jesus' death on the cross, oh, it's just too simplifying it. But Jesus paid that debt. But just like that, Paul says to him in verse 18, if, if we go on, he says, if he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it. He says, whatever he's taken, whatever is debt that he owes, whatever damage that he's caused, I will pay it. And you know me. And I will pay that for him. He steps in, not only just as, as an you know, token words, you know, well, I know this guy, he's a good Christian now, you know, you, you bring him back. No, he says, we're going to make this right. And I'm, he, he can't make it right. He's a slave, he has nothing, all right? But I will make it right. And he steps in for him, just like Jesus stepped in for you and for me, all right? But I've taken you through all of this because I want to get you to verse number 20. I want you to look at verse number 20. It says, Yea, brother, let me have joy in thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. This joy is more than just happy. All right. I have some, some neat tools to help me as I study my Bible. I have an 1828 dictionary, which helps, you know, understand, you know, what words meant, you know, when, when the Bible was, was translated, what, what those words were there. And it's, you know, we, we have words even in English, even sometimes they, they, they change their meaning. You know, if we were to say something is awful, what do we mean? If I say, well, you know, my sister baked some bread, her first shot at baking bread, okay? It was awful. You know how awful it was? I used those loaves of bread for car ramps for years after. They were so hard, okay? That was awful, but what, what the word awful actually means is full of awe. Like we could say, well, that sunset is awful, but we're going to think, what's wrong with the sunset? It's beautiful, all right? But, it, but the words sometimes have, have meanings changes, all right? But there's, so that's very helpful to look at this, this dictionary just to kind of make sure that we're on the same wavelength as when it was translated for us. But also, there's some other things, you know, that, that, I, that I'm able to look at. And, I, and you don't need to know Greek in order to understand the Bible. You don't need to know Hebrew in order to understand the Bible. But there's some things there that, that, that can help us. And this word joy here, this word joy, yea, brother, let me have joy of thee, is not the same as the other 62 New Testament references that use the word joy. This word joy is the same word You know what our theme is? Show our theme slide up there, Greg. There's our theme, to grow in grace. And it, that's, that's our theme for this year is to grow in grace. And it goes with the, with the reference of 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18 that says, put that one up too. <laughs> All right. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be both glory now and forever. Amen. But to grow in grace. This word in Philemon, verse number 20, is the same word as grace in that verse. It's just another um, way to show us what God's grace is. It, God's grace can bring joy. And this grace here that, that Paul is asking for Philemon to show is, is a grace that is going to bring joy. There's, it's, it's, although it's not the same as those other 62 references, it's, it's, there's still a connection there, all right? And this grace brings, it, it's joy. It's joy in doing things the way God does things, all right? Grace is, 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 is getting what we don't deserve, all right? It, it's, being, it, it's being what is not deserved. It's by a, and, and, it, and it's so important for us that we... Grow in grace, as our theme says, all right? But for us to grow in grace, this is another aspect of it. Exhibiting the grace of our Lord, some, getting something we don't deserve. Philemon may not deserve this, or I'm sorry, Onesimus may not deserve what I'm asking Philemon to do, but it's grace, all right? And it will bring joy. This, this grace and joy are, are synonymous here. But it's giving a gift of grace just as God has offered us his grace by salvation. The act of grace for me 
The act of grace for Onesimus, the act of grace is for the Lord. It is pure joy to be like Christ. And that's why he commands us to be like him, to be like-minded with him. You know, we're, we're commanded to grow in grace. We're commanded to be like Jesus. You have that chorus. I was going to sing that. We're going to sing a different song when we close here. But there's that, to be like Jesus, all I have to be like him, all through life's glory. All right, and, and that song, to, to be like Jesus. But it is it's commanded that we be like him. He came to, to uh, set the example for us. And it, it is so vital here, as we see here, that what he is asking for is this grace. This grace that we can step in. You know, as, 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 I, as I said at the beginning, we are created to answer to God. But we can't grow in grace. We cannot grow in grace until we've accepted his salvation personally. You can't. You cannot be anything like God, anything like Jesus, until you accept him and his payment for you. And it is so, so vital that each one did this. Onesimus, he lived in the local church. He lived here. And yet, he was still bound for hell because he had not met with God on a personal level like he finally did when he was in Rome. And it is so important. It doesn't matter how often you've been here. You could live here just like Onesimus lived in the church. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, if you've never come to the point where you've asked Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know what you did on dying on the cross for me. And ask Christ to forgive you of your sin. You are as lost as Onesimus was when he ran away. God showed mercy to Onesimus in, in letting him run into Paul. And Paul could show him the way of salvation. God's brought you here. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, God's brought you into this building. You can hear what, what the truth is from this. It's, it's not Steve Taylor telling you this. This is God's word, all right? That you need Christ as your Savior. And if you know Christ as your Savior, if you do know him, you know what you need to do? We need to grow in grace. We need to be able to do what Paul was asking that Philemon do with Onesimus to forgive him, all right? and to welcome him back because, you know what? He belongs to God like I belong to God, like you belong to God. And as it said there in that verse in Colossians, that there, we're brothers together. You have the opportunity to serve a great God, all right? But if you don't know Christ as your Savior, you can't do that. You can't do that. You need him as your Savior first. That is step number one, the most important decision you can ever make in your life. Not what you're going to do for a living. Not what kind of car you're going to drive. Not who you're even going to marry. The most important decision you can ever make in your life is give my heart to Christ because of what he's done for each one of us. If you haven't done that, I urge you before you leave this place today, there's all kinds of people here who love to pick up the Bible and tell you, show you from God's word what you need to do to accept Christ as your Savior. But if you know Christ as your Savior, we need to grow in grace. We need to grow in grace. Let's pray. Precious Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Lord.